This evening we have a rather involved situation, and therefore we had best explain as far as we can the difficulties in order that no false concepts develop as we proceed. The state of the study of atomism in ancient India is actually not clearly known. A number of factors have contributed to the dilemma. First, uh, we are dealing with a language uh, situation that is most complicated. And it is only possible for a few highly advanced Sanskrit scholars to really explore the depths of their own very complicated language. Up to now, this type of scholarship has been rare even in India. Uh, with the rise of the modern attitude toward knowledge, most Indian educators have definitely accepted or assumed the Western position. They are far more concerned with the advancement of modern scientific viewpoints than in digging into their own ancient literature. Perhaps it is the same as with many other things. Foreign beliefs have charm. Our own have become too familiar, and we pass over them lightly. The question arises then, is there any actual proof of the existence of an atomic theory in ancient India? By ancient we mean now the period, for instance, of the Veda or of the early Upanishads. Here again, it is doubtful if a half a dozen living Hindus have actually explored this literature thoroughly. It just rests waiting for better times. Up to 25 years ago, even the average Hindu scholar would have denied the probability of material relating to this field of inquiry in the very early Indian literature. But within the last 10 years, certain doubts have arisen. And some Hindu writers have actually advanced the theory that atomism was known in the Vedic period. And that certain symbols, allegories, fables, legends, strange terms not easily translated or not even easily comprehended after the lapse of ages may well refer to this particular field of inquiry. In any event, I would say that now we have no true evidence uh, that the atomic theory was not known in ancient India. We have very little evidence that it was. We do, however, note a rising group of Orientalists who believe that there was a fairly well-integrated concept at a very early time. They base part of their opinion on early texts where certain passages could certainly be interpreted to suggest a knowledge of the atomic theory. And they base further uh, positive thinking upon another fact, namely, that about the beginning of the Christian era, atomism did appear in India. Now, where did it come from? The first thought might be that it reached Asia from Greece or North Africa, possibly through the campaigns of Alexander, which brought a great deal of Grecian culture to India, or even possibly as a result of isolated Greek philosophers who managed to reach India 
uh, probably shortly before the beginning of the Christian era or even earlier. When we study, however, the atomic theory as it develops in India, the idea that it was brought from Greece is rather inconvenient. In the first place, we might assume that if it did develop from certain traditions, philosophical or religious, which flourished among the Grecians, uh, that it would follow in general the thinking of the Greek states. This is not true. It does not follow very closely the outline which we went over in the first talk of this series last week, in which we did summarize at least as best we could uh, the basic thinking of the Greek philosophers of the 5th century B.C. The Indian thinking is essentially different. And if we are to assume that Indian philosophy did attain a comparatively high standing at an early date, it seems more probable that the atomic theory as it arose among the Hindus was a traditional descent from their own culture. That somewhere in early times these foundations were laid. We know that there is a peculiar habit in the East Indian mind. Uh, it is a little like ours in this respect, perhaps, namely that there is very little recording of origination. The discoverers of things hardly get their names into permanent record. Some ancient Hindu who made a magnificent discovery is totally forgotten. These discoveries were not important to these people. Uh, that which was important was the gradual building up of tradition around a discovery. If a discovery stood for 500 years and a positive school arose to disseminate that, then the founder of the school and his followers received the publicity. The original author did not. This was a usual process. And as it generally required from three to five hundred years for an idea to develop a strong adherence in the mind of the thinkers, the coming of the atomic theory into public recognition in around the first century might well indicate that it had a background of three or four hundred years. One thing we do know in the early writings is that the Hindu was playing with what has been called the philosophy of infinitesimals. That's an awful thing to call a philosophy, because some never outgrew that state, apparently. But at the same time, it is a curious and intriguing thought. The problem of smallness. The uh, mind of man has a tendency to take things apart. He finds out how they are made. And he also assumes uh, that the smallest conceivable things suggest further inconceivable degrees of smallness. The old story we've all heard before of what is smaller than the flea's mouth. And the inevitable answer is that which goes in at that mouth. There seems to be no possible answer except that. So whatever smallness we discover, seems to suggest a continual smallness, a continuance of reduction to an infinitesimal state. So the Vedas had already come to the conclusion, for example, that Atman, which is the universal being, the universal consciousness, should not be regarded alone as great. And it is referred to as the smallness of the small. That actually we can honor a thing in two ways. By considering it so vast that it fills all space. Or else considering it so small that it becomes the common denominator of all other things. This is a perhaps a strange way of looking at it. But the old Vedic thinkers certainly came to this conclusion. They therefore 
came to the natural belief that all things retire into continuing degrees of smallness until somewhere there is an utter or absolute smallness. Now having gone this far, they are not too far from the concept of atoms, because they did recognize a unit of smallness, but they worked with it essentially from a religious point of view. So this unit of smallness became the spark of life. It became the infinitely small unit of eternity. And to meet the next question that naturally arose, our ancient Aryan forebears began to speculate with the concept of relativity. They were not without some rather serious thinking on this. They said to themselves, when we say smallness, what do we really mean? Do we mean something that is really small? Or do we merely mean something that is not so large as something else with which we compare it? Also, how shall we estimate the actual nature of smallness? How shall we determine whether we are small or large? How shall we try to determine in space the, con the concatenations of magnitude. It is quite conceivable, for example, that the solar system we live in and all that inhabits it may be regarded as only a gnat in some cosmic sunbeam. It, we don't know how small small is or how large large may be. Therefore, it is quite conceivable that infinite smallness is only a term, and that we, could we consciously experience it, it would seem as great as what we call largeness. The Hindu would, of course, go on to insist that the experience of Atman would be infinite greatness, and yet the body of Atman might be infinite smallness. The next point that uh, undoubtedly affected these old Aryans, because they were people of the earth, was the ever-present mystery of the seed. The seed growing in the ground. The mysterious productivity of the tiny seed, which might come forth from the earth and manifest itself a hundred thousand times its own size. Therefore, a seed certainly is not as large as a tree. But a seed can grow to become a tree. And all things seem to grow from a smaller state. The plant grows from its seed into a complete plant. So that everywhere in the universe, the principle of the seed seemed to suggest itself to our primordial ancestors. To them, the idea seemed to be that the universe grew from a seed. They constantly emphasize this point. Now, if the universe grew from a seed, this seed might be very tiny. And yet, in the course of eternity, it might grow into a vast organism. Uh, certain of the early Hindu speculators, therefore, believed that space was filled with seed of all kinds and that worlds were constantly growing up in this mystery of space. And the lotus was the peculiar symbol of this because of the way in which it produces seed, drops them back into the water, they fall to the bottom, and then grow in their own right. Thus the growth of a tiny seed into a great organism impressed them. And it came to their conviction that everything had a seed of some kind. They also began to contemplate what might happen if they assumed, for instance, that space was like Earth, and that in this Earth was an infinite number of seeds. 
Now, obviously and evidently, all these different seeds do not grow at once. Also, obviously, by some law, the seeds falling from plants and trees do not all grow. They fall into a soil that is capable of sustaining a certain number. Others are destroyed by the elements or by the birds of the air. Only a certain number of these seeds actually multiply and increase themselves. Others seem to die. We have the same thought in the New Testament of the seed that falls on sterile ground and the seed that falls on good soil. And this uh, concept led the ancient people always in the direction of the idea that things had their roots somewhere, that these roots came from seeds of some kind. We are not too far from some of this thinking even at the present time. And uh, these stratosphere balloon flights that were made some years ago seem to indicate that the outer atmosphere of the earth, far beyond that rarefication in which men can live, that this outer atmosphere contains minute spores or kinds of seed cells floating in space, and that these, when drawn within the atmosphere of some world or planet, would then perhaps explain how these globes originally came to be fruitful or to have life appear upon their surfaces. Certainly, if they were in a previously molten state, it would not be likely that the seeds of life could exist in such a state. Therefore, they must be conveyed afterwards. And various concepts were developed to help to understand these various uh, problems. For well, they were very distinct problems in the thinking of ancient man. In India, uh, the atomic speculation uh, became more or less associated with what might be called the non-religious descent of thought. The religious systems uh, shied clear of it, particularly the early ones, uh, because they were essentially mystical, they were essentially non uh, scientific in their essential attitude. To them, uh, science was merely a phase of a more important subject, the phase of religion. But India also produced, as did Greece and many other early nations, philosopher scientists who even approached a rather definite degree of materialism in their thinking. There were both mystical and materialistic, materialistic schools of philosophy in India. The materialistic schools were the ones that began to play with the concept of atoms. And as a result of that, we do not find too much bearing upon it in the earlier religious literature. Now, India worked on the same problem the Greeks worked on, but they went about it just a little differently because they had a different basic theology to work with. In India, uh, the universal process of creation came as a result of a primary motion or being which these per, uh, scholars uh, accepted. This uh, being was one of the elder divinities of the Veda, or this motion was one of the great eternal impersonal principles of Yoga and Vedanta. In other words, the universe arose either from a deity or from a state of consciousness. And this state of consciousness, according to some schools, was later symbolized as a deity, but was essentially of itself a continuing state of creative consciousness. This consciousness actually existed in a continuing meditation, 
all things arose in this consciousness by yoga. All realities were inwardly envisioned by this consciousness itself. There were two views as to the uh, locale of this consciousness. According to one view, it was complete or total, inhabiting all space, filling it with a tremendous meditational, flowing, internal awareness. According to the other group, this consciousness was a center, a point, a, an area sunlight in the midst of space, radiating itself throughout space. These different scholars also uh, concerned themselves with the possible relationship of this consciousness to space per se. In other words, was this consciousness space? Or was this consciousness a primary being inhabiting space? Did space have an existence apart from this consciousness? Most of the schools took the attitude that there was an eternal fact, and that fact was space. Space was the vast stage upon which the drama of existence unfolded. What was space in reference, for example, to consciousness? Obviously, to the Hindu mind, in spite of any effort uh, to rationalize the situation, space seemed to be greater even than consciousness. That is, it exceeded it. For that which holds all things must be greater than anything that it can hold. And it must also be greater than the sum of all that it contains. Therefore, space becomes an absolute infinite. Consciousness becomes something a little different from that. So it led these early people to speculate concerning the relationship between space, we will say, and immortality. Consciousness could conceivably be immortal. Space could conceivably be eternal. Therefore, an immortal being inhabiting an internal space seemed to sort of tie the package up rather neatly. But there were other questions, and even the ancient peoples were not afraid to ask them. They were more inquiring in many things than we are. So they naturally asked the question, if consciousness is immortal, then we are dealing with something that has an always existence. And if space is eternal, we are dealing with another factor, with an endless or timeless duration. And we come finally to the same essential point in this that the Greeks came to, that it was necessary to postulate two almost equal eternal factors. The Greeks at one time referred to these as ether and chaos declaring, therefore, that agent and patient, or the worker and the thing worked upon, both had to have an eternal existence so that the job went on forever. This, uh, to a measure, ended a lot of argument. And it was a lot of argument that we have never been able to terminate ourselves in Western thinking, because we have been rather slow to accept the eternity of consciousness, and for that matter, the eternity of space. But if we finally differentiate between these two enduring things, we are differentiating between two abstract factors. We are dealing with an absolute consciousness which we cannot define, and an absolute space which we cannot define. We are also dealing with again this problem of previous existence.
was this eternal consciousness at any time different from the way it is now? Did it come somewhere, or did it come from somewhere? Has this consciousness always inhabited the same distribution of space? Has it always had the same space allotment? To the uh, East Indian thinker, uh, this type of question suggested another point. Namely, that consciousness itself, having an eternal subsistence, uh, coeval with space itself, that consciousness pass through conditions, but that these conditions in no way basically affected its relationship with space. In other words, creation to the Hindu was a periodic phenomenon. Creation was an objectification of consciousness. Uh, the disintegration of worlds, the final uh, resolving of creation into chaos, was simply a gradual retiring of consciousness from an objective to a subjective state. Thus, to the Hindu thinking, the principle of consciousness had within it a certain tidal rhythm, a principle of patterned motion. And this motion of consciousness was not from place to place, but from state to state. Therefore, it was a kind of a fourth dimensional motion. Thus, consciousness did not grow up Consciousness, however, did have a rhythm in its own eternity. And like the tides of a great ocean, consciousness ebbed and flowed within the infinite area of space. And this ebbing and flowing resulted in the appearance and disappearance of creations. And this ebbing and flowing, which was the inhaling and exhaling of Brahma, corresponded in the meditation school to the internalization and externalization of consciousness. Thus the Supreme Being, meditating upon creation, caused this creation to exist as a thought within its own nature. This being having exhausted the meditation upon creation, having carried creation from its infinite beginning to its infinite end, ceased its meditation upon creation, and immediately the illusion of the world ceased. Now the next natural problem that would arise from this is the nature of the consciousness which abides in space. How shall we understand its essential nature? Of what, of what is it composed? How is it fashioned? Of what is it made? And to the ancients, particularly the scientific atomists, this consciousness was, in the early atomic schools of India, regarded as atomic. Therefore, deity is actually uh, an atom an atom of incredible and inconceivable power. When this atom retires into itself, it becomes the immeasurably small. When it emerges from itself, it becomes the inconceivably great. But the moment that it, can, uh, that it ceases to press itself outward into manifestation, it gradually retires again into itself. And in retiring into itself, it seems to retire into the infinitely small, becoming a seed less than a seed. Now the parallel to this uh, will be found in certain of the Vedanta concepts, and therefore 
uh, we can do something with them. Let us now think in terms of consciousness meditation itself. The individual entering into the state of meditation or into the state of deeper insight experiences the gradual enlargement of internal until this in internal consumes him. And in the state of samadhi, this internal has become infinite. And by means of it, the individual identifies the experience of infinites in his own nature. As a being, he has ceased. In samadhi, his objectivity has ceased. And he stands upon the very brink of the extinction of consciousness itself. Yet approaching this, even this brink, he experiences a kind of mystical unfolding of himself. As one mystic expressed it, he suddenly beholds the universe within him, instead of being within the universe. Thus, by means of the meditative discipline, the subjective or internal life expands until it becomes more vast than the world, and no boundaries of time or space as we know them can contain it, and it threatens momentarily to burst through into total universality. Then if the mood is changed, and gradually the meditating uh, devotee begins to reintegrate upon the objective plane, this vastness of the internal diminishes until finally objectivity as we know it with its illusional uh, sensory types of perception uh, close over this internal experience. And this tremendous power in man retires again to become the infinitely small. For in the average person, his own spiritual equation is infinitely small. It is so small that he cannot even find it. Yet under certain moods it expands. Under certain other moods it contracts. But in the maximum of his objective awareness, uh, the internal or subjective awareness becomes merely a seed again, a tiny unit capable of an infinite manifestation. Thus the uh, thinker in India, conceiving of the Atman Atom, or conceiving uh, of the eternal principle of all things as an atom, bestowed upon this atom an infinite vitality, an incredible absolute potential, and then conceived the unfolding of this potential uh, into uh, a potency or power. Let us try to tr understand this just a little bit by another type of analogy. Some of you have probably seen motion pictures of the blossoming of flowers in which the speed of the camera was reduced so that you could actually see the flower open slowly. The camera uh, was so set uh, that you saw in a few minutes processes that perhaps required several days. This slow unfolding uh, will give you a concept of exactly uh, the type of opening up uh, that the ancient uh, thinker assigned to the idea of his spark, his tiny flame, his minute point, which uh, derived from the Hindu religion was taken over by the scientific group to form the basis of the atomic concept. Now presume for a moment that a tiny spot of life, infinitely small, uh, received into itself the quickening power of destiny. The time for it to awaken came. Now this awakening we think of 
as an awaking into objectivity alone. But in the Eastern mind, this awakening was merely the unfolding of the seed of meditation within the consciousness of this principle. The infinitely small, then, began to unfold, and uh, wonder upon wonders, it released in great cycles or waves from within itself, like circles of petals opening in groups or singly, it gradually unfolded its own potential. It brought forth from itself suns, moons, and stars. It brought forth from itself constellations and galaxies. It then further brought out from its own nature planets. And as these planets in turn, by this slow motion, began to unfold their own internal potentials, these planets began to bear life. Life in turn began to grow and unfold its own potential. And finally every form of life, conceivable and inconceivable, manifested as a chain reaction, waking up out of this central sleep and touched by this motion or by this awareness of internal consciousness of the atom itself unfolded its own potential. And out of each of the creatures that was released in this way came forth more seeds, for the human body is a mass of these seeds, in each one of which is an infinite capacity to enlarge or increase or manifest, until finally from this one atom that burst forth the entire cosmos. And this cosmos was nothing more or less than the unfoldment of the immense potential of the atom. And having exhausted its unfoldment, the same thing happens that happens to the plant, which having brought forth its fruit, proceeds to wither and die. By degrees, all of these innumerable manifestations fall away into space. And in space, they are broken down again into their various component units. And these units return to the infinite reservoir of space. But the consciousness, the life, the meditation of the meditating being is withdrawn from these forms one by one until at last, the flower seems to close again, and from its own closing to return into its stems and into its roots, and finally once more into its seed. And the walls of the seed seem to close around it, and where there was once an infinite manifestation, there is once again only a tiny germ floating in the mystery of space. Well, this is a pretty big thought, you know, when we get working on it. And it has some interesting possibilities. But it does point out very largely an analogy derived from the observation of the natural forms of growth. It, however, does give us something that perhaps is a little bit consistent with modern thinking. It suddenly reveals to us the incredible power that is locked within this minute seed-like thing. Now this atom of the Hindu speculation is probably not just the atom which attracted the attention of Professor Einstein, but it still does carry this a wonderful thinking namely that from every unit of space may emerge a total creation, extending throughout time and space, being simply the release of the consciousness energy of the atom, and that this consciousness energy is released by a form of meditation, an inward enlargement of existence that through this, therefore, creation is no longer regarded as a valid material world, 
but as a dream existing within the heart and mind of an eternal dreamer. Now, the poetic phase of this was also quite natural to the Oriental mind. About this time, the sect of the Jains took over this particular field of speculation and began to work with a kind of atomic theory that is a little closer to the Greek schools, but also has its differences. To the Jains, for example, uh, there were only two existing things, space and these units of life called atoms. The, uh, these two operating upon each other produced existence. But in order to explain their problem in a little more reasonable way, uh, the Jains had to establish somewhat different quality within the atom itself and that recognized by the Greek. For example, in the Jain philosophy, uh, there was no longer just one kind of atom. Uh, the Greeks had this basic concept that everything was built from the same material. The Jains, following the essential philosophy of Hinduism, recognized the possibility and the probability that atoms, or these infinitely small particles, were of four basic types. Your Hindu ancient, uh, along with some other people, particularly the uh, Greco-Egyptian culture group, held the reality of four elements. They said that the world was created out of the combinations of four elemental substances which they called earth, water, fire, and air. Later, the medieval European philosophers sort of improved it a little bit. They declared that the universe was composed also of these four elements, but they called them carbon, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. But they still had four elements. Now, the Hindus had a fifth element. But the fifth element, Akasha, uh, was a kind of permeating essence. The fifth element really was not a true element. It was a kind of spiritual mist that was associated with life processes. Uh, the Hindus had essentially four elements. So when the Jains began to speculate with their atomic theory, they came to the conclusion that there were four basic kinds of elements and four basic kinds of atoms. Therefore, the, there was the earth or physical substance atom, the water atom, the fire atom, and as they called it, the wind atom. For to them, Air in motion had to be something in motion. It could not be nothing in motion. It had to have a, a structure, a substance. Out of the four kinds of atoms, therefore, all forms were built up. Uh, to these people, atoms also had more uh, definite shape qualities uh, than among the Greeks. Uh, the Jains recognized several shapes of atoms, and they recognized in the rudimentary power of atoms the rudiment of color, the rudiment of sound, which later goes into the ragas of Indian music, uh, the rudiment of flavor, the rudiment of odor, and various rudimentary principles. Therefore, when a group of atoms built up a form, this form not only had a body, but an odor. It not only had an odor, but it had a sound or a tone equivalent, a thinking much, mu much like that of Pythagoras. Uh, it also was true that these forms built up out of atoms had flavors as an apple which has a form, it has a color, 
You can taste it, and it has an odor that is peculiar to apples. To, uh, to assure these propensities within things, the Jains held that the rudimentary substances from which these things were composed must also have these attributes. But these attributes were too minute in the atom itself to be discernible. Therefore, the atom contained the potential of certain characteristics and qualities, and they also laid down a principle that was later to be taken over by the Buddhistic atomists who did their own peculiar little trick with it. But for the present moment, uh, it is enough to simply say that each group of atoms had to create a response in the sensory areas or the skandhas in man, and that the only way in which a quality or attribute could be conveyed from the outer world through the sensory perceptions to the brain of man was that, the, that this form or this nature had to have an energy or a vital archetypal existence. In other words, it had to be something that could convey its own qualities to the individual. Now, in certain things, such as odor, we observe that this quality radiates from the object so that it may be uh, sensed uh, at a considerable distance, uh, whereas some of the other perceptions must approach it more immediately. So the uh, Jains also went on to say that uh, these minute units, which were atoms, were as units and atoms indivisible, but that any two atoms essentially dissimilar could unite, forming in space a vast number of pairs, uh, that the natural tendency of atoms was to unite, but that this union was always according to opposing qualities. And it wasn't long, of course, before you could get into the concept of your sympathetic and antipathetical elements. For instance, a fire atom and a water atom would mingle because they were opposites. An earth atom and an air atom would mingle because they are opposites. Whereas certain other compounds would be indifferent of each other therefore would not naturally mingle. But on the ground that we all notice, particularly in matrimony, that opposites attract each other, and sometimes never cease to be opposites, this particular attitude resulted atomically in the creation of dual atoms. Now the dual atom, like the single atom, remains invisible. The next act in the development of them is that these dual atoms form together into triads, a triad consisting of three pairs of atoms. The moment three pairs of atoms unite to form a triad, what is to the giant thinking a conceivable form emerges into existence. In other words, the most minute thing that the human being can see is a unit of these six atomic uh, structures. Now, the ability to see these, however, uh, was also uh, rather carefully analyzed by these uh, ancient ones. And they came to the conclusion that without a certain internal extrasensory power, this compound still remained invisible. But that it was conceivable that it could be seen. Now this meant that at a very early stage in their thinking, the Jains began to conceive that from the combinations of compounds, various forms could be built. 
in themselves compound beings. Thus, in the Jain philosophy, you in some way sort of escape from one of the dilemmas of the Greeks, namely that all different things come entirely from the same thing, and the difference lies only in arrangement or number. The Jains say no, that the arrangement also includes quality that there are therefore these four kinds of atomic structures and that uh, as they proceed after you have, for instance you get a group of six forming this triunity which forms the next important unit this unit also by its chemistry becomes a unit a total unit again a one with a predominant or pervading nature. This unit, in turn, must attract its own unit opposite from the field of potential, and it draws to itself another group of six which have become a unit. And this process goes on. And in the course of building up this chemistry, the problem of similar and dissimilar is met by the fact that gradually the composition of the as accumulating structure uh, by the law of opposites ultimately becomes so complicated that it can draw all of the four elements into itself in some cases. In other cases it does not do so. For example, to the giant, for instance, the element of water, all of the oceans, rivers, seas, and rains of the earth are the result of the gradually building up of only a small group of units. The fire-water combination alone infinitely multiplying itself. In the case of the element of fire, which seems to be the, the same general polarity, but represents the opposite group. Also, your fire-water groups have to form the element of fire. But in the course of time, or in the course of the infinite mingling and blending of these atomic structures, one has come to dominate the other. If humidity dominates, the element remains water. If heat begins to dominate, it dries up the water, and you have fire. Now, uh, all of the simple elements that we know are therefore composed of the most simple compounds. The most complex pattern we know is man himself. And in his nature, all of the elemental principles have become involved. And in the building up of his atomic structure, a whole group of atoms have been brought in to form various structures, organs, uh, and various tissues. All of them, however, built gradually from the accumulating of these units of six until finally the whole compound is assembled. Now the Jains go a little further and they take on the concept that when these atoms form these various patterns, that these atoms in a mysterious way seem to be ensouled by a connective or a power that radiates from themselves or not necessarily radiates, it um, emerges from themselves. Now, for instance, if you have a set of six of these three pairs making a unit, you have not only an outer unit of the six, but you have a kind of inner unit, because to these, to this unity of the six atomic forms is added a series of subtle unities of qualities within these forms with the result that the akasha, or fifth element, is released. Because the a fifth element is a principle which is a binder in all of them. 
And it is this binder which is always released whenever a set of six atoms unite. And from this binder emerges that part of man uh, which is not body, but which has no uh, tangible existence apart from body. For from the Akasha principle is gradually unfolded the internal psychic life of the individual. The soul, therefore, has a certain existence in the more subtle phases of the atom. Now let's try and explain that a little more simply. The form of the atom, uniting, creates structure. But the atom also has a flavor. It has a color. It has a sound. It has a scent emanating from it. Therefore, these other qualities, which are not directly involved in the physical structure that is built up, result in the building up of a sensory structure which is capable of perceiving these attributes because it is essentially composed of them. Thus the atom has within it what you might broadly term a psychic nature which also combines to form a composite psychic entity at the same time that it forms a physical unit. This building up of continual psychic entity through all these compounds in which perhaps ultimately billions of these atoms unite, all this time the psychic compound is also building up from this union so that your form becomes an external body and an internal integration of qualities. At any given time, this internal integration of qualities bestows characteristic, uh, bestows temperament, uh, bestows emotional quality, anything uh, that is not pertaining to the form itself. Now this unit that is built up to the Hindus, for example, the primary units were not perhaps what we call molecules, but they were, might be a little like them. So we have another uh, giant concept, namely that the atom is to the molecule what the soul is to the body in man. That, uh, that always the minute particles carry the overtone or the upper part of things or the upper qualities of things. And always the units which compose consciousness are finer or smaller than the units which compose matter. And a certain number of matter units forming a pattern release the smaller element units which are contained within the atomic structure. And this gives the giant another definition, namely that while an atom theoretically cannot be destroyed, the atom can and does have parts. Now this is what the Greeks were not so sure of. They didn't like to think that the atom had parts. They thought it was indivisible. The giant said, yes, it is indivisible, but it does have parts. These parts exist within it, but cannot be divided from it. But these parts in the aggregations of atoms also exercise their own aggregate qualities. About the year 600 B.C., Buddhism appeared in India. And we hear a great deal about Buddhism today. We hear a great deal about its contributions on various ethical, moral, cultural, and spiritual levels. But uh, you do not hear very much about Buddhistic science. You do not hear very much about uh, the patterns of basic theory uh, which were developed in Buddhism as a rationalization. Remember, in Buddhism you had doctors and you had scientists, you had biologists and chemists, just as in every other religion of the world. And Buddhism, like other faiths, had to have a certain scientific pattern 
by means of which natural sciences could be reasonably advanced. It was especially true in Buddhism, for this philosophy religion never attempted to restrict or limit any form of scientific discovery. The scientist could not be a heretic in Buddhism. It was assumed that he was merely exploring one mystery, and that this mystery was both scientific and religious, and that nothing that the physician could discover could be in conflict with, with, with what the mystic had perceived in his inner experience. So there was no conflict of ideas at all. In uh, Indian Buddhism, we do not have too much uh, further information on the atomic theory. It will be probably uh, found in time, however, that as Buddhism was essentially reformed Hinduism, that the basic ideas that were dominant in Indian thinking did affect Buddhism, just as the basic ideas of Jewish and North African thinking did affect Christianity, so that uh, the principles remain comparatively the same. When Northern Buddhism broke away about the beginning of the Christian era and moved north, uh, we find immediately in the Great Vehicle, or the Pure Land sect, the coming forth of a clear statement of atomic thought, but we do not have it until that time, which would place it about the first or second century. Much of the opinion or doctrine bearing upon this subject uh, was reserved, recorded, and taught in Tibet. And in the great monastery libraries at Lhasa and Tashilampu, uh, were important collections of early Buddhist works which included contemplations upon the nature and structure of atoms. Now, this is no metaphysical hearsay. This is known to be so. This particular type of research must, of course, be made to fit into Buddhist philosophy, and here was a kind of a little rub. Because, as you remember, the Buddhists did not basically believe in the reality of matter. This kind of creates complication. To them, the universe is a sort of uh, area of illusion. The universe exists only because of certain psychic experiences of man. That is, the universe, as far as man is concerned in it. The universe, therefore, is not eternal. Let us put it that way. In uh, Buddhism, the universe is the child of necessity. The universe exists with all its laws because creatures exist who try to be lawless. And if man keeps the law, the law itself falls into mystery and is never seen again. Laws are for those who break them. Worlds are for those who have not learned to live without them. That is the essential principle. Therefore, it would not be conceivable to the Buddhist that the atom could be an absolute abstract reality. The atom, therefore, had to be some kind of a structure partaking in and of the illusion of existence. The atom, therefore, also had to be something which exists for a time and then does not exist anymore. This idea uh, that we have of the eternity of time and space and substance, these ideas were foreign to the Buddhist thinker. Buddha never denied that man had a body but he denies the essential reality of that body. Buddha did not say we did not have a house to live in. He did not believe in the non-reality of matter in the sense that we look at something, see in it, and it isn't there. That was not his concept at all. What he uh, believed in 
was the non-essentialness of these things. They exist because man exists in a certain state. If man, for existence, uh, for example, lived in a different dimension of consciousness, a house would be no good to him. If an individual lived on a different level of spiritual reality, his body would be no good to him. These things belong to him here and now because of what he is here and now. They have no actual infinite existence. So what are we going to do with this particular subject? What are we going, how are we going to handle it? Uh, the answer to the Buddhist thinking seemed to be that your atom was the basic unit of the power of cognition. In other words, the atom is the very substance out of which thought and idea originate. Therefore, atoms are thought, idea, entities, or units. They are units upon which almost any concept can come into existence. And thinking is drawing together mental atoms. Nirvana, or the ceasing of personal existence, is the scattering of these mental atoms back again into their cause. Here we have a new dimension, a world in which space becomes thought. And in this same universe, what we call motion becomes will. Therefore, the universe exists only of will and the object of will. And the object of will is a conjured up mental image of the thing willed. Uh, to Buddhism, the will is not the uh, separate power in man by means of which he determines to bowl over a rock down the street. Uh, to Buddhism, will is the power in man which causes him to think about a rock and to create a series of circumstances by the operation of his own will thought uh, factor. Uh, as um, Nietzsche points out and also Schopenhauer, the universe of Buddhism consists of will and obstruction, will and obstacle. So what we have now is will in the form of a, an energy, a consciousness, obstruction being the Buddhist equivalent of matter. Uh, we have obstruction to will. We have resistance, energy resistance, constantly operating against each other. Energy is made up of one kind of atoms. Resistance is made up of the other kind of atoms. So, you have your will atom and your resistance atom. Now, what is essentially the difference between will and resistance? Essentially, the difference between will and thought. Because thought always is resistance. A new idea is resisted to the bitter end. Uh, we uh, invited to outgrow a fault. We resist it to the bitter end. I don't mean the fault, I mean the... Uh, invitation to overcome it. So in Buddhism, you have will as a motion, but this is a motion moving something that has an existence. It is moving against something else, and it is moving, therefore, against the opposite of itself. Now this brings another interesting phase of Buddhist atomism, as actually taught in Tibet. Namely, that there are, therefore, psychic mental atoms. These psychic mental atoms we call selves. And every self is a psychic mental atom. The self 
by means of its various processes, builds up the union of the atoms which have the self-principle in them results in the gradual building up of a body which has a self in it, the compound body being always equaled by the internal compound of the self element. So form and self build up together. And the more the pattern of the body looks like a human being, the more the self in that body acts like a human being, until we finally get the human aggregate, and it is then motivated by the human self energy. Now the self is composed of atoms, of which the greatest of them are the five groups of the skandhas. The skandhas simply being the faculties or attributes by means of which we function in various sensory levels of awareness. We are aware because the atom of awareness in us is aware of the atomic structure of other things. It's all a struggle in the level of atoms. Now, the, uh, both the Hindus and later, particularly the Buddhists, worked in a nice moral principle into this thing, which I think is rather uh, quaint and unique. Atoms now not only have color, taste, shape, but atoms now have the potentials of good and evil. In Buddhism, atoms are moral entities. The fact that we cannot conceive them as moral, the fact that their lives are so minute that we would hardly like to assume that they have mentality or anything of that nature, Buddha, the Buddhism tosses this aside with a gesture on the simple grounds that our natural tendency to think that nothing is intelligent but ourselves is a pure case of egotism. Actually, the atom has intelligence. If it did not, then no aggregate of atoms could be intelligent. The only way you can escape this is to assume an intelligence apart from the atom. The moment you do this, you're back in deism again, which your scientist doesn't like very well either. Either the atom has a soul, or the atom is ensouled. And Buddhism prefers the, uh, uh, the fact that, Buddha, that the atom is a creature with a psychic life, just as the Jains assumed that it was a creature with color and number and form and taste and flavor and these things. So now we have atoms that contain within themselves the potentials of good and evil, so that in all creatures that are composed out of atom, atoms there is conflict, the conflict being the psychic conflict in the atoms themselves. And the reason why conflict is so difficult to overcome is because it is in itself inherent in the very structure of things. As a result, however, of the fact that atoms have this quality, they also have the power of attracting and repulsing other atoms with the same or opposing qualities. Now, according to Buddhism, all action, all conduct, all thought, and all emotion exercises a magnetic force, and everything that we think, everything that we do, every plot, scheme, and strategy that moves through us, every uh, condition of consciousness draws atoms, draws them from space around us. And out of these atoms, is created a vehicle which is called the karma body. Now this is a phase of the subject which probably hasn't 
been uh, tossed around much lately in the West. But karma is also an atomic structure. These karmic atoms drawn in to the complex of the human life therefore represent all types of condition drawn by attitude. An individual, for example, is by nature stubborn. Uh, by career, he improves it. And by the time he is 60 or 65 years old, he is a monument to stubbornness. Now, the fact that stubbornness has grown in him simply means that its atomic structure has built up. And while we do not think of stubbornness as a being, Buddhism thinks of it as a condition or a state. And Buddhism says, actually, no condition can be a non-existing thing. A thing either exists or it doesn't. If a condition exists, if an attitude exists, if an impulse exists, then it must be composed of material by which existence is possible. If your thought does not have some kind of an existence, it is not a thought. Perhaps we could explain some of these matters by our concept of vibration. But to these other people, vibration would be simply another term for atomic arrangement or the vitalizing and activating of, of atomic structures. So hate it is a mass of hate atoms. If you draw more of them, uh, the hate structure grows by increased vitality. Love is a group of atoms. Now this solves something we've all been worrying about for a long, long time. Everyone has tried to find an, a, a good definition of love. It is an atomic structure. Now that solves everything. <laughs> but actually, love either is or isn't. The mere fact we cannot see it has nothing to do with its existence. If it exists, it is something. If it is something, it is atoms. That is your Buddhist statement strong. Because it must be something or nothing. It cannot be nothing because it exists. Therefore, it must be atoms. All these different abstractions are atoms. Now, we are fully aware that to a measure, we can demonstrate part of this to be true even now. We know, for example, that when we place a little sack of lavender in a drawer, and it scents the contents of the drawer, that this odor is an emanation that this odor is not simply nothing because it is not physically attached to the little sachet bag from which it emanates. We know also that the motion picture, that the television is not nothing because there is no direct line between it and the studio. In other words, things can have an invisible existence as sound. This sound is an invisible existence, it is true, but according to the northern Buddhists, it is also an atomic structure because it can be conveyed from one person to another. It can go over mountains and valleys and be heard. Therefore, it has to exist. And everything that has this kind of existence has to have an atomic structure. The next point that they make is that little moral point I was telling you about, namely, that according to Buddhism, the building up of the karma body by the attracting of atoms results in the gradual integration of what almost might be termed a not-self, a negative polarization. A negative polarization that becomes a kind of asura, or demon, a principle of darkness, 
the same elementaries described by Paracelsus von Hohenheim, that this sin body, so to say, this body of error, remains with the individual until the exhaustion of karma. And the exhaustion of karma is, of course, uh, the gradual reduction of the magnetic attraction which draws the karmic atom until finally the individual, by no longer drawing Ill, Ill to himself as the result of his own magnetic processes, as soon as this begins to slow down, the atoms are less rapid in being drawn into this complex. If man ceases hating, the hate structure is no longer vitalized. Little by little it is devitalized until finally it disintegrates for lack of energy. For actually these atoms are drawn and release certain energy. And until the power that draws them is cease, or rather ceases, uh, the energy available in them is released for the perpetuation of the negative characteristics. Now, uh, Buddhism, also working on this principle, comes along with another very interesting uh, angle. And that is that beyond man, there is a series of states. There is the state of the Arhat the individual who has entered upon the path of renunciation. There is the state of the bodhisattva in the northern school, the being that stands practically upon the brink of eternal realization. There is the Buddha who has attained, not as a single person, but as an order of life. For well, the ancient Buddhists recognized the existence of many Buddhas. But these all consist of orders of the degrees of emancipation. Now in the process of slowly breaking down illusion, illusion in this sense being false confidence in that which cannot endure, it is the, it is the fact that the ends we seek cannot be found in the material world that constitutes the true Buddhist concept of illusion. According to their doctrine, there is slowly built up or brought into manifestation something else, and that is that there exists this an, another kind of atom. This other kind of atom, which is apart from the four, however, does not have an eternal existence in space. It is actually an atom that is built in the fifth element field, Akasha, or the soul. And the fifth element is the thing that has a beginning but no end. And this kind of atom to which Buddhism refers is actually the Buddha atom. This gradually develops or manifests, and according to Buddhism, this becomes the secret of how atoms begin. Namely, that atoms all have their beginning in an infinite concatenation of time, through infinite time and space, that all atoms begin by this process of the creating of the Buddha atom, by which, to make it as simple as we can, uh, a new unit of cosmic energy is gradually created by the disciplines of self-direction. And at the, as the time goes on, the impermanent or karma body composed of atoms slowly disintegrates. And at the final um, edge of nirvana, at the very end of things, 
a different kind of atom comes into existence and the, and this atom takes over. This atom is infinite life. This atom is something we cannot conceive of at the present time, but it is the one real, real type of atom that does exist, and it is not involved in creation at all. But it is the reason why everything lives. It's the reason why space and the atom can exist. And the attainment of the nirvana, is des as described in Buddhism, or the illumination of Buddha, is to a measure a representation of this. For it is the bursting of this great sun of light. It is the achievement of the mysterious eternal unit that constitutes the Buddha atom. Once this atom is created, as Gautama points out in a number of his dialogues, this atom comes into existence on that occasion when with fullness of contrition of spirit and of mind, a B, no matter how humble, how uneducated, how uninformed, or what land he may live in, no matter what part of the earth or race that he may come from, whenever that human being inwardly resolves that his life shall be useful to another, in that moment the Buddha atom is born. In that moment the service of good takes over upon the personal selfishness of life. Therefore, in the, the Jataka tales where these stories are unfolded, always the beginning, ten kalpas ago, twenty kalpas ago, innumerable ages and eras of time, all of this the beginning is that the humble man, whether he be prince or pauper, whatever be his state, when he comes to his knees and he humbly says within himself, I desire the good of all more than I desire the good of myself. In that moment, the Buddha atom is born. It is at that moment also, according to the Buddhist, that a seed drops from the lotus throne pond at the, at the foot of the throne of Amitabha into the pool of life. At that moment, the Buddha seed is sown in the paradise of Amitabha. Now it may take millions of years, hundreds of ages and generations, before this little dedication, gradually flowering, gradually unfolding and expanding, comes finally uh, to the fulfillment of its destiny. But this is the planting of the Buddha atom, the atom which will ultimately end in the magnificent burst of cosmic light in which the personal vanishes forever in the universal. This is the seed of salvation that is referred to in several of the ancient scriptural writings. Thus there is an atom, a kind of psychic atom, that is created by the discipline of evolution, the discipline of growth. And it is made possible because of the akasha, or fifth element, which is locked within the other four elements, the atoms of which constitute the body and its indwelling personality apart from its sleeping consciousness. So this moves along until finally we have the emergence of this great mystery, the mystery of the complete consciousness atom. The motion of Buddhism was, of course, uh, carried not only into Tibet, but moved relentlessly on into China. In China, 
We know that at a comparatively early date, not later than the 4th or 5th century, uh, the Buddhistic schools had taken so firm a hold in Chinese consciousness that already their instruction largely completed uh, the older patterns are set forth by Confucius and Lao Tzu. Thus, Buddhism, the northern school of Buddhism, having established itself firmly in China, and then having spread throughout China and Korea, and later traveling upon, into the island kingdom of Japan, in this pattern, atomism moved into China. What do we know of atomism prior to Buddhism in China? What we have said about India will very largely cover this point. If Indian language is difficult to translate, Chinese is worse. And even the best Chinese scholars today are unable to be certain of the translation of many classical works. There is nothing more difficult in the world than to translate a highly technical Chinese document. Even the Chinese cannot always do it, and even their best scholars cannot always do it. Therefore, we have only a certain popular margin with which to work at the present time in estimating uh, the Chinese view on this. They followed the Buddhism principle uh, with certain uh, distinct Chinese innovations in the atomic theory. They divided the atoms again into four elements, but they had a rather funny way of doing it. For instead of uh, dividing them as we do, they divided these elements into conditions of quality of character. Thus, for example, uh, a human being was composed of a certain number of atoms of salvation, a certain number of atoms of perversion, a certain number of atoms of contention, and usually somewhere concealed within it one beautiful, radiant little Buddha atom. And they made little pictures out of these. They were very delightful. It, it looked like a little package of your favorite flower seeds from a local store. They were all different colors. But these atoms represented no longer just physical atoms, but quality atoms. They were the compound which make up the life and the heart and the works of men. In medicine, however, the Chinese were also aware of a certain amount of atomic fact. And, of course, I suspect that we will not get much further with this than to the study of the I Ching or the Classic of Changes. This mysterious book, which is said to me the most wonderful book in all the world, makes, of course, a series of diagrams called essentially trigrams. These trigrams, incidentally, are each ultimately composed of six individual units, apparently being partly derived from the Hindu system of atomics, where the six always constitute a unit. In the uh, classic of changes, uh, two marks stand out, the full line and the broken line, and upon this the entire theory of Chinese ancient philosophy is built. These two lines simply represent positive-negative. They represent what we might term life form, spirit, matter, above, below, heaven, earth. They represent a vast number of opposing values and principles, and the symbolism by extension goes on to infinity. They also compose out of this situation a set of eight compound patterns, each composed of six lines. This constitutes the full structure of the basic concept. And uh, one of the early missionaries that went to China pointed out 
that to the Chinese, these lines represented a patriarch, the creator of things, the matriarch, the mother of all things, and the three positive branches and the three negative branches, their sons and daughters. Also that these eight, according to the Chinese story, were placed in a ship, and this ship floated upon the surface of the sea when the world was destroyed, and later when the dry land reappeared, this family of eight came forth and populated the earth according to the sworn testimony of Fu He, the first heavenly emperor. Now this parallel to the story of Nor is rather too pointed to be overlooked. For here we have again Nor, his wife, the three sons, and the three daughters, who must repopulate the earth. This structure of lines broken and whole lines goes right back to our original concept of the nature of space. Namely, that space represents uh, a, a polarized area in which energy and space itself become the positive and negative attributes. But the Chinese, bless their souls, they always did it that way, always made the negative positive and the positive negative. Therefore, to them, the empty space is positive and the principle of activity is negative. Why? Because the Chinese mind says positiveness is duration. Uh, a man is important as he gets older. If he's a hundred years old, he begins to take on real significance. Uh, in China, that which endures is always most important. Motion ceases, but space does not. Motion is restricted. Space is everywhere. Obviously, space is the more important. And the mere fact that it is empty doesn't make the slightest bit of difference. Whether it is full or empty, it is a totality, and a totality eternal, inevitable, and immutable as the first distinction. Now in China, as we say, there have been three great systems of philosophy operating. And as a result of that, we have bound to find in their various speculations a mixture of beliefs. So we have the broken and the whole line representing uh, the receptive principle and the objective principle. And these two continually producing patterns or compounds. This, in turn, requires to the Chinese, however, the preservation of the concept of heaven. And heaven, in this case, was not only superiority and space, but heaven was also a spiritual factor. So in, uh, in your Chinese atomism, you have motion, you have uh, space. You have atoms, you have vacuum. You have these two balanced polarities. But in China, you have heaven ordaining all of the motions of atom in space or in vacuum. Therefore, heaven becomes more than the positive atom. Heaven becomes the lord of atoms. And China frankly acknowledges the existence of a power superior to the power of the atom. It does not, however, insist that this power is separate from the atom, but declares that the atom has two parts, its outer part corresponding to earth and its inner part corresponding to heaven. Therefore, the atoms can have their own heaven and earth. The atom contains both God and nature. The atom contains both motion and silence, or stillness. The atom contains both power and space. For well, each atom also possesses its space allotment. These atoms are, as in India and among the Buddhists, seminal, or seed-like. 
but from the accumulation of these atoms, all structures are formed. But the Chinese, with their natural love of everything that is artistic, have created a concept that the universe is assembled by the sheer artistry of law. That universal law produces not only the world, but produces it in infinite beauty, infinite goodness, and infinite wisdom. It is all these things because it consists of heaven moving through form. And we uh, find the same thought very largely contained in the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu. It is motion moving in space, an infinite rhythm. And that which moves is only motion because it moves something. Pure motion in a vacuum could not be known. But motion causing atoms to dance can be known. Motion moving these atoms, both internally and externally, causes each atom to be suspended between heaven and space. The, the heaven above moves the atom. The space below contains the atom. The heaven and earth in the atom result in its equilibrium or its suspension because it contains both principles. And heaven and earth in the atom are the promise of man. For man is the unfoldment of the atom. In Chinese philosophy, all forms of nature are unfolding. And all forms of nature are unfolding their heaven quality and their earth quality. And they are binding heaven and earth together by an equilibrium. And this equilibrium is man being an embodiment of the principle of reason. And reason is a kind of spindle by means of which heaven and earth are united. For reason contains the will of heaven and the simple wisdom of the earth. So in uh, Chinese philosophy, the Hindu and Buddhistic principles both come into play. But they also develop one unique principle of their own. And that is the recognition that not only is the atom dancing in the midst of infinity, but that infinity is also within the atom. That, if the, that the atom is a kind of a door. And if you could step through that door from this world to the world within the atom, you would step out of a very little house into an inconceivable mansion. For that which is locked within the atom, because we are no longer worried with size, dimension, time, place, and these other boundaries which we have arbitrarily placed upon principles, that actually, if we could step through the atom, we would step from the darkness and insecurity and uncertainty of a very tiny world into a luminous world of energies into an inconceivable region of powers and forces. And in this stepping through, we would therefore move into a new dimension of heaven and earth. And we would see an earth of infinite magnitude and a heaven of infinite power. And we would realize that the atom suspended between the two and and more or less partaking of both is the most rudimentary compound and that it is this compound that makes man possible it is this compound that brings forth the birds the bees and the trees and the flowers but it also finally brings forth from its own potential its own equilibrium power and that equilibrium power is man for it is man who must reconcile heaven and earth. It is also man who must sometime learn to use and not abuse the deep, mysterious power that is locked within the mystery of the atom. Time's up. Time's up.